you this evening. Let's all stand together, please. Let's begin by singing. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory.
Lord to bless, to continue to bless, I should say, our service this evening and to lead us into His Word by His Spirit. And that's so important that we're always asking God to lead us by His Spirit. And so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear Lord Jesus, that we have another opportunity to gather together. And Father, we've come into your house to worship you. We've come, dear Lord Jesus, to lift up your name in song and in praise and choruses. And we thank you, dear Lord Jesus, that we have voice to do so and opportunity to do that. And Father, we also look to come into your house to learn and hear more about you. We do that through your word, your precious word. And we know, dear Lord God, that while it is written on paper and is contained within a book, that, dear Lord Jesus, your word is alive, and it is alive by your Spirit. And so, Father, we ask for your Spirit to come upon us this evening through your word, that it would touch us, that it would reveal something fresh and new to each and every one of us, to show us, dear Lord Jesus, an area perhaps where we can grow and gain greater strength, to thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for another portion of our lives where you've met the need time and time again. I know, dear Lord, that you speak to each individual by your word, through your spirit, in different ways, and that different portions of scripture touch each and every one of us at different times in our lives. But regardless of how you touch us, or what portion of scripture meets us this evening, we ask, dear Lord God, that we be fed at your table that you have prepared. And we thank you and praise you for all the food that you have in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. This evening, um, we want to give thanks and praise to God for the reality that is Him. Now, what I mean by that is that, really, the world, those that do not know the Lord as their Savior, they, in fact, spend all of their time being led by Satan, trying to um, receive, trying to grasp the things that God has given to his children. And what they end up with is imitation, something that is not real. And what God's people have uh, at our disposal that we can always access, if we're willing to, is the reality of what God is willing to give to all people. But once we're saved, we're, of course, his children. Let me give you an example of what I mean. The world speaks of peace. Now, we understand that, and we know, that the peace that the world talks about is something that comes about when a group of people sit down and they negotiate and they come to some agreement. They write it down on a piece of paper um, or they put it in some kind of a document. They sign it. And somehow, that's supposed to make all of the problems go away, all of the conflict that was there, all of the hatred that came about as a result of that conflict, the trials, the tests, suddenly because two individuals, or three, or however many, put their name on a piece of paper that says peace, the world thinks that that's going to give them peace. Now, history shows us that just doesn't work. It didn't work in biblical times when natural flesh tried to uh, come up with a, some kind of peace agreement. And it doesn't work in our day and age today. Because the things that man puts together on his own are really always imitations of what God has for his people in truth. So if I continue with that example... When God gives us peace, it's a completely different thing, if I use that word, a completely different gift, because the peace that God gives isn't something that man can take away. It's not written on a piece of paper. It's not something that just sort of glosses over the pain or the hurt. There's restitution involved in peace. There's forgiveness involved in peace. There's love, and there's kindness. There are all kinds of different aspects of God that are part of the true peace that God gives to his people. 
I'm not going to speak on peace this evening, but I'm going to speak on another one of these um, attributes, uh, these feelings, really, that the world is constantly trying to achieve, and that's joy. Tonight I want to touch on joy as we see it in the scripture, so that we understand that the joy that the Bible speaks of, the joy that God's people have within them and can demonstrate to the world is not anywhere near the same joy that the world thinks they have. Because, fundamentally, real joy can only come from God. And if it's not coming from God, then there's only one other source that it can come from. And anything that comes from Satan is a lie. Anything that comes from the devil is, a, is, is an imitation. It's not real. But Satan knows that the things of God are great and much to be desired. And so what Satan tries to do is create a likeness. He tries to come up with something that is as close as possible to what God can give, but without the reality, without the longevity. Let me put that in there as well. So, in the scripture, the first thing that we have to recognize and all agree upon is that real joy is a gift from God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 where it speaks about the fruit of the Spirit, okay? So anything that is a fruit of anything else, so if I talk about the fruit of the apple tree is going to be an apple. The fruit of an orange tree or bush is going to be an orange. The fruit of a cherry tree is going to be a cherry. If you have a plum tree, the fruit is a plum, okay? And so here we're talking about fruit from the Spirit. So if you think about the Spirit as being a tree, the only thing that can come from God's Spirit is great, is wonderful, is true. It's not fake. It's real. And so when in Galatians 5.22 it speaks about what the fruit of the Spirit is, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, and you know we have gone through, and we've spoken over time about each and every one of those different types of fruit. But I needed to start there because we have to recognize and remember the joy is part of the list. It's there. This is something that comes to God's children through God's Spirit. And so the first place that we have to go when we are seeking joy, and so when I speak of that from now on, I'm talking about the real thing, okay? Not the fake, but the real thing. Our source always has to be God. And because that source is God, we need to connect to Him. We need to have a relationship with Him. We need to have communion, fellowship with God's Spirit. Because joy only comes through the Spirit of the Lord. That's bad news for people who are not Christians. Because what that means is that they will seek and they will search. And they will try this and they will buy that. And they will do this thing or the other thing or whatever. And anything that they can come up with that might seem to be joyous to them is never going to last. Because it's always something that comes from the flesh. And it's something that the flesh experiences. And in case you haven't noticed, our flesh is full of fault and failure. It lets us down over and over and over again. And in the same way, then, we have to understand Anything that the flesh creates, you know, a building, a chair, your clothing, your house, a car, guess what? It's never going to last forever. It doesn't matter what you do. Because none of us really can comprehend what forever means, first of all. 
So it might last 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. Could it last a million years? Like, I mean, you know, you could put whatever number you want there, but as soon as you put a number there, it's not forever. And so when we try to achieve joy in the flesh, how do we do that? Well, we buy something, and we say, well, that makes me happy. I'm full of joy. We go somewhere. Oh, I'm so happy that I'm here. I'm full of joy. We do something. We experience something. And that, we say, gives us joy. But in case you haven't noticed, that joy tends not to last. Whereas as God's people, because joy comes as part of the fruit of the Spirit, and because God is the Spirit, and God is eternal, then anything that comes from the Lord is everlasting. Now that's not to say that we can't lose God's joy, but the only way that we do that is if we turn God away. Okay. So as long as we abide in Him and He in us, I believe we can have all of these gifts, and in particular joy, that the world just cannot understand. Just like the peace. Okay. Because the world looks at it in a natural way, and scripture shows us that it is something completely different. Matthew chapter 25, as I was thinking about this particular word, which is not a real big, long word, in any way, since, uh, in any way whatsoever, I, I, was, uh, I was drawn to this parable where Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're not going to read the entire thing. We, there are multiple examples here. Jesus speaks about the wise and foolish virgins. And then, starting at verse 14 in Matthew chapter 25, he starts to talk about, right, the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. And then we know he gives his servants different talents, different portions. And then he comes back to collect on those things. And those that did what they were supposed to do with the talents that were given... Um, they are invited. And, you know, as I read then verse 21, for example, it says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. And it's this next phrase that's interesting. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, and I've always assumed, and I believe I'm assuming correctly, when the Master says, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, or now we know this is God then who's speaking to the saved, when they say to you, when the Lord says to you, and I pray that he will, and when the Lord says to me, and the same, I pray that he will, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I'm thinking about heaven. I'm thinking God is inviting me into heaven. And I believe I'm correct. But notice what that means. Come to the conclusion that I've come to, that heaven equals, put an equal sign there in your mind, heaven equals the joy of the Lord. Being in God's presence, where there is joy. Or as it says there, enter into the joy of thy Lord. See, heaven, this chorus says, is a wonderful place, right? It's a beautiful place. Filled with, and then when we go on and we talk about heaven, there is nothing there that describes heaven that I see as a negative. They are all elements, parts, descriptors, of things that are going to bring us among many different emotions and many different feelings, the feeling of joy. Because heaven is where God is. And God, being a spirit, and his Holy Spirit, gives us, what did we read as part of the fruit? Joy. So when the when Jesus describes heaven as a place that you can enter into, and so we have that image, right? Entering through the gates and coming 
before the Lord and entering into his city. The Bible talks about the city. All of these different descriptors. It's a place that we can go into. You see, when I started looking at this idea of joy, and if you take a moment and you say, well, what is joy? Is this joy? This thing? Wait a minute. No, that's not joy. How about this? Is this joy? Well, the first thing we have to say is joy is not something that you can sort of pick up and see. There are things that in the natural we say could give us joy. So if you're really hungry, and so my mind suddenly thought about pizza. So if I think about a pizza, the pizza can give me joy. It fulfills me. It makes me feel good. I feel, you know, complete in a sense. All right? But just like the world's joy, the pizza's gone. And eventually I'm hungry again. That joy doesn't last. But my point here is that there is nothing that you can put a finger on that you can really say, this is joy. All right? What we're talking about is a feeling. And feelings are sort of like the wind in the air, right? It's something inside our mind. It's, just, it's something we experience. And when, if I, I looked it up and it says joy, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. If it's a feeling, what's a feeling? Is a feeling something that you can purchase? No. A feeling is an emotional state or reaction or a belief. A feeling is an emotional state or reaction or a belief. You see, when we receive and when we accept the joy of the Lord, the only way we can do that is believing in the Lord. And then God says, and Jesus describes this thing that I can't put my hand on, joy, as being a place that I can go into. And that place is God's presence. And because it is God's presence, then as God's people, we can have the joy of the Lord right here. If God is in our presence or we are in His. See, this is the blessing that we have as God's people. I don't have to wait until I get to heaven to have the joy of the Lord. But I do have to be in God's presence to have that joy. And so I, I, I want you to see, and I, I've talked about this before, how scripture is so linked together. How we can sing a chorus one Sunday, whatever it happens to be, right? And we could sing, in his presence, in his presence, there is, and then the chorus goes on, right? But all of these things, that when we link this all together, what we see is, is the word of God is over and over and over supporting itself. It's showing us how all of these things fit together. So being in God's presence is critical. And having the Spirit of the Lord is vital. And by having those things, then we can have the joy of the Lord with us here, not just in heaven. And that's important because the Bible then tells us that even in temptation, even in trial, even in test, we can have joy. Obviously, the Bible's talking about something that is not the natural kind of joy that the world has got to be something bigger and better. And it is. And as God's people, we have access to that. And that's important. In John chapter 16, we see further uh, clarification or a little bit more uh, explanation, if you want to put it that way. John 16. And Jesus is speaking here again, and I'm in verse 22. John 16, verse 22. And Jesus said, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man 
taketh from you. Once again, you see how, I hope you can see how that scripture is linking joy to Jesus' presence. And as I sort of meditated on that a little bit, when Jesus is speaking here, I guarantee you, if you are one of God's children, there will come a time when you will see the Lord again. And I'm thinking, when I get to heaven, I'll see Jesus. That's his home. It's God's house. And he'll invite us in, just like that master that we read in Matthew told the servant, enter into the joy of God. Thy Lord, or the Lord. You see, Jesus is saying the very same thing here in John when he suggests that right now you might have sorrow in the natural, but you'll see me again. Yes, I will. When the Lord comes to take me home. And home, my home is in heaven. And that's where God is. And God is all things good and great. And one of the gifts God gives us is joy. See, that's how I link it all together. It all builds one thing upon the other and supports the word that God has given. Romans 14 and verse 17, once again, provides us with another piece of support. And here, a differentiation or making a difference between the world and the God's gifts. Because it says in verse 17 of, of Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. You see, here again in Romans, we're making reference to the fact that the things that bring people joy, meat and drink. Right? People, oh, look at that amazing spread. And you go to your favorite restaurant, you go there because it's a favorite, because it makes you happy to go there. You enjoy being there. It brings you joy. But that's not God's kingdom. That's just a natural sort of fleeting moment. And we're told that here, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but what is the kingdom of God? But righteousness and peace, and look at here it is again, and joy in the Holy Ghost, in God's presence, in the Spirit. You see, things that are in the Spirit cannot be taken away from you or from me. No matter how hard the enemy tries. Right? They can take away all our natural possessions. They can take away our natural freedom. They can take even our lives. But they cannot take away what the Spirit of the Lord has placed inside us. These are the things that count. These are the things, are the things that are forever. And one of them is joy. And this is why when you read verses, and we're now jumping into the Old Testament and I close here, I have in Habakkuk chapter 3, Give you a second to find it. Habakkuk. Chapter 3. It's a small little book. Only has three chapters. But I really like the last verses in chapter 3. Starting at verse 17. And I have them marked and circled and, and starred. And they're really, really important for me. Because here the Lord, I believe, was showing Habakkuk something. He said, Although... And I've circled that. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, well, that's a sad thing, neither shall fruit be in the vines. Okay, this is not getting better. This is getting worse. Now, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. Oops. Uh, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet. See, this little word, yet, is really important. You know, this is one that education was trying to jump on, and, and, uh, and really, not a bad idea. But you need the Spirit of the Lord to make this real, because you can't do it without God's Spirit. You see, verse 17 is a, just an abysmal picture, right? 
I mean, if it's going wrong in the natural, verse 17 kind of has it covered. You know, and you can say, the world around us is just falling apart. I mean, we got changing climate, you know, and we got this problem, we got pollution, the air is polluted, the water is polluted, the ground is polluted. Everything is a mess. We got inflation, we got this, we got wars and rumors of wars, we have all kinds of natural disasters going on. Yet, and that's the big piece right there. Yet, what does it say? Yet, I will rejoice. Oh, wait a minute. How is that possible? You must be faking it. You see, the devil would say to the world, to people without the Lord, the only way you can have joy is by having all these things. And what the scripture says, all those things can disappear. But you can still have joy. And not some kind of fake thing. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet. Okay, that means, to me, that's like a mountain goat. Sure-footed. Now, if you've ever seen, I've seen, never seen it in real life, but I've seen video, you know, and I mean, they're going up the slope, and if you look at that, there's like, how in the world can they jump up there and stand on that little rock? And then you look at their feet, and that makes it even more perplexing to me, because they just have these little hooves on the end of their feet. And you think, how in the world can they even feel what they're landing on, and yet they are so solid? Okay? And so the scripture is using that example. He will make my feet like hind's feet. In other words, nothing's going to knock us down. And he will make me to walk upon my upon my high places and then it says to the chief singer on my stringed instruments all right so uh, words of, of song words of joy but only if we can say i will rejoice in the lord i will joy in the god of my salvation not in the things we own not in, you know, how, what we look like. You know, some people look in the mirror and I guess it brings them joy. And then as they start to get a little more elderly, they see a wrinkle here or something there or whatever, and they start to panic. And they want to preserve what they look like because they like what they look like. And they're afraid that they won't have any joy as they change and maybe look a little bit different. It's just another example, right? But the point is, the only place that real joy exists is in the Lord. And because of that, we can say, yet I will rejoice. And we have to keep going with that sentence, because, you see, the world will say, yet I will rejoice in, and they'll try and put some natural thing there. But that's not what Scripture tells us. Okay? So don't even bother trying to get happy in all those other things that are here today and gone tomorrow. If you want real joy, if I want real joy, we have to go God's way, and we have to recognize that joy only comes, the rejoicing only comes in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. That was written a long time ago. A long, long time ago. And I don't know if the Lord showed Habakkuk what the world would be like in 2022. The trials or the tests that might be out there, the things that are going on all around us, the depression, the suicide rates, the overdosing that's going on. Why? Because people can't find any joy. They look at the paper, they look, whatever, they just look and all they see is disaster, mess, unhappiness, sorrow, but not God's people. At least, God's people shouldn't be looking at it the same way. We are to be a lighthouse, and part of that lighthouse's duty is to shine a light into the darkness. So everywhere else is dark, but the lighthouse still has light. 
why we don't call it a dark house. We call it a lighthouse because it has light when all around is darkness. And for God's people, though all around us people are gloomy and complaining and sad and this isn't right and that isn't right and I want more of this and more of that and I don't want some of this and some of that. What are God's people to do? Let's shine real joy into that gloomy environment and recognize that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now we're not going to sing it again. But could you turn with me to the song we sang? Okay? Just get a hymnal. And I'm not going to, we're not going to sing it again like I just said. But having now looked at this topic and this idea of what joy is, we sang number 230, so I left my book open, and it says joy unspeakable. And I want you, just very quickly, let us just look at the words of the verses now that we perhaps have a refresher of what Scripture says about joy. And I hope you will see that this person, B.E. Warren, was definitely led by the Spirit, as far as I'm concerned, when these words were put down. Because, I have found His grace is all complete. He supplieth every need, so it's all coming from God, while I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. I have found the pleasure I once craved. It is joy and peace, where? Within. What a wondrous blessing, I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. See, as God gives that gift of salvation, and that's what I talked about in Habakkuk, right? the Lord of my salvation. In Him we have joy. I have found that hope so bright and clear living in the realm of grace. Oh, the Savior's presence is so near I can see His smiling face. I have found the joy no tongue can tell how its waves of glory roll. It is like a great or flowing well springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. You see, this author understood and shares with us in these words where joy comes from. What joy really is. Right? And that, you know, it seems to me when he uses these words, I have found, there was some searching. There was some looking. But then he says, or she, I'm not even sure if it's a male or female, it doesn't matter. I have found the joy no tongue can tell. How its waves of glory roll, it is like a great oar flowing, well springing up within my soul. Where does real joy come from? By the Spirit of the Lord that dwells within God's people. That's within. And from there, it can spring up so that regardless of what trial or test we are going through, we can have the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. So stand with me, please, this evening. And as we close in prayer, thank God, thank God, that we have that resource. See, this is something the world does not have. And they're trying to find it. Remember what I said at the beginning. But they will not find it. Now, we have it. Let's not lose it. Let's not let go of it. Let's not let Satan cause us to turn away from the truth, which is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you, dear Lord Jesus, for the many, many gifts that you give to your children. By your Spirit, as we read in the Scripture, we are able to receive fruit. We can sit down at the table that you have prepared and receive all of these gifts to our spirit, to our soul, into our mind, that we can have that the world can never take away, that Satan cannot drag out of us. But, dear Lord Jesus, that these things will sustain us, will help us through the difficult times, help us through the valleys that we will travel through. Scripture, Lord, you said there will be trials, there will be temptations. But in all of those things, all of those moments, yet we can rejoice in the Lord of our salvation, in the Spirit of the Lord, who makes us strong, not through my might, 
not through my mind or my brilliance or anything that I have. But God, it all comes from you. And it's a blessing to us. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be thankful, thankful, thankful people. And that, Lord Jesus, we would be able to demonstrate, to witness, to share with the world around us the difference that God makes. How the Lord is able to give these real gifts, the real gift of joy, the real gift of peace. All of these things only coming from God. And may we, through our testimony, be able, dear Lord Jesus, to help others to come to know you as their Savior so that they can also experience the joy of the Lord and the blessing of having you dwell within them each and every day. Thank you, Lord, for your gifts, for the Word, which helps to clarify and remind us of what's important. And as we pray for others and we bring to you our petitions, and perhaps, Lord, there's someone here tonight going through a valley, going through a test. I pray, dear Lord Jesus, that that spirit, that person, would understand and receive a, a fresh anointing, a special touch upon their body, soul, and spirit, that they will feel as they leave this place tonight that they are not weak, that they need not be sad, but, dear Lord God, that you have provided something that will help all of us and help them to overcome their current situation. For, Lord, we know that there is coming a day when we will see you face to face. And we pray, dear Lord Jesus, that by your grace and mercy and love, we will hear you say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.